Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. And before we begin the Dharma talk, let us recite together the mantra of the universe and its purity, Om Nam, two syllables, seven times. Please. <coughs> Om Nam. Om very much. For me, it's a special significance that we have convened here in the Church of St. Francis of Assisi tonight, and we practice Zen meditation. As most of you know, Zen really came about by Buddhism and Taoism merging together. The merge was a very peaceful one. It took hundreds of years, and there was a person called Bodhidharma who put the final seal on it about a thousand years after Buddha Shakyamuni himself. Saint Francis of Assisi bears similar significance for European thought and worship. A little over a thousand years after Jesus, he did something which gave a lot of perplexities for the church, for medieval society, and renewed the faith in ways no one could have foreseen. What is common between Bodhidharma and St. Francis of Assisi. They did something really important. There was something established, already operating for a thousand years in its own culture, and they got people, including the leadership and organized religion, out of their comfort zone. They created new paradigms within a larger paradigm. They were not rebellious, they were revolutionary. And this revolution became an evolution something we can still use and we can connect within ourselves. Were it not for Bodhidharma, the first Kongan would not have appeared. And the first Kongan really happened between him and Emperor Wu. Bodhidharma's reputation preceded him as he went from India to China. And when he arrived, he was invited to the royal court. And the emperor asked him, I have supported countless monks and nuns I built countless temples. How much merit did I gain? Bodhidharma said, no merit. Then what is the meaning of the holy scriptures? The emperor asked for the second time. No holiness, only vast empty space. Bodhidharma responded. Then who is standing in front of me? The emperor asked for the third and last time. Don't know or no mind or no thinking, depending on the translation, Bodhidharma said. The emperor was confused. He didn't know what to make of this. He was a well-educated emperor, Emperor Wu of Liang. He had high-class monks in his court advising him, teaching him the sutras, Buddhist wisdom, but nobody could prepare him for Bodhidharma's visit. And he said, I find nothing common between us. You may leave. Bodhidharma crossed the river Yangtze, went to Shaolin, and sat in a cave for over nine years. After his departure from the imperial court, the emperor asked Master Qi, the monk residing in his court, Sifu, who was this? And the monk said, he was the incarnation of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, carrying Buddha Shakyamuni's mind seal. And the emperor was deeply saddened and disappointed with himself. 
And he said, please, please, invite him back. And Master Chi said, please don't bother your majesty. Even if you sent the whole country after him, still he would not return. The three exchanges between Bodhidharma and the emperor, they show the emergence of Kongan practice. Most of you have had Kongan interviews, and this is wonderful. Literally, Kongan means public case or public document. In the old days, in Tang Dynasty, China, when they had a document, they had to copy it by hand. They put the original and the copy next to each other, and they put a seal over both edges. If there was any question of authenticity, then the copy was brought back to the imperial library, and they put the original and the copy together. And if the seal created the two halves matched, then it was considered authentic. Kongans mean that we depart from the rational. We go towards the intuitive. We supersede and transcend our intellectual and emotional patterns. We go beyond our karma and we find a realm there which has been unopened or undiscovered for us. It's the realm of intuition. In the West, many people believe that intuition is just being quick-witted or emotionally intelligent. And this is far from the truth. Being emotionally intelligent and intellectually intelligent, this is very necessary. And this is very wonderful. But it's like Newton physics and Einstein physics. That's the difference between the two types of intelligence that I have mentioned and intuition itself. Intuition is the direct, unmitigated function of our true nature in a given situation, relationship. To evoke that function, we need to be like good athletes who pass the baton from one to another in relay running. The first 100 yards, maybe it's your intellect that carries you on the path. The second 100 yards, it may be your emotions. And when you all run out of steam, then the baton passes to something, someone you don't know. You heard during Kinhin today, it's not you who is walking. You just walk. There is just walking. And that's one of the entryways to that. When the mind of the student wakes up to the teacher's mind, then the two halves of the stamp, they match. When the question in the Kongan matches the answer and they are complete together, that's authentic. So the paradox is beyond the orthodox. The established knowledge is not enough. But if we don't use that, then we lose our initial direction. If we do not go into the intuitive, if we do not embrace the paradox itself, then we cannot transcend our own karma. We cannot function clearly without a self, totally one with the universe, yet distinctly free and responsible at the same time as individuals. Yes, you heard it right, individuals. At the beginning of the path, we have the totally wrong idea of ourself. And that ignorance produces suffering. Suffering for ourselves and suffering for others and the world. So we have to dismantle this self-image. Layer by layer, just like you would crack an onion layer by layer, the false layers of identi identification is gone. Only the root remains. That root is not edible. That experience is not something you can describe by words or put into a form. But when all the layers are gone, then the root is laid bare. Then you know where the onion comes from, how it grows, what it's made of. We in our monastery, and I assume in this Zen group, regularly recite the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra is truly the prajna paramita, the essence of transcendental wisdom. And in that, 
you find a very important sentence. Originally, the five skandhas are empty. So the form, the body, all your sensory perceptions, feelings, impulses, forms of consciousness, they are all created. They are all relative. They do not exist by themselves. Where do they come from? How do they come about? What is it that makes us human? These questions, they point to the same direction. In meditation, when you suspend all willful activity of yourself and you are just being present, you can attain a mind which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. If you attain this point, this is completely without thinking. This is the gateway to Zen when there is no more dualistic mind. You are here. Your dualistic mind is gone. And that's when you can rebuild yourself consciously, clearly, for the benefit of all beings, including yourself. And this new individual is not unknown in the West too. Look at the rebirth stories while being in the same body. Look at the spiritual renewal that many people go through when they forego the worldly, they forego their previous habits. And Kongans are a great help for that. When you go to the interview room, all your karma comes out. When you cannot answer a question, all your reactionary mind manifests. Let me give you an example. Zen Master Zhou Zhu, in Chinese, Zhao Zhou, he was one of the greatest in the Tang Dynasty. He did not take official teaching position until he turned 60. And for another 60 years, until he turned 120, he was teaching and practicing, and sometimes going from monastery to monastery. There's over 300 stories with him recorded as teaching opportunities teaching cases, and one of them goes like this. Zen Master Joju visited two hermits. He asks the first, did you get it? The hermit just showed his big fist. Joju says, the water is too shallow for me to anchor here. And he moves on and visits another hermit. Joju asks him too, did you get it? That hermit also showed his big fist. Joju says, you have truly attained freedom from life and death. I bow to you. Questions. Why did Joju approve of one, but not the other? If you were the first hermit, how would you have answered the Zen master? If you had been the second hermit, how would you have answered the Zen master? The first hermit's fist and the second hermit's fist, are they the same or different? If you think, then your intellect puts your mind into an infinite loop. Sometimes going chaotic, sometimes going organized, but the inexplicable, which you try to explain, the unreasonable that you try to reason out, will put you into an infinite loop. And in the meantime, all your mental habits appear. And as you look at that, you can disengage from that. You can stop being identified with that. Thus, you can transcend that. We can think about ourselves in a lot of ways. We can have various sorts of self-image. But when you are put into a conflict, into an unresolved situation between hammer and anvil, then your true character comes out. Well, so it is with Kongan interviews. Because as the Kongans get more and more difficult, you get more and more frustrated at any negative feedback because you are supposed to know. Well, it was not your knowledge that solved the Kongans in the first place. It was something else. The sun in the sky shines everywhere. Why does a cloud obscure it? 
Everyone has a shadow following them. How do you not step on your own shadow? This whole universe is on fire. Throughout what kind of samadhi can you escape being burnt? This was made by Kobong Sunim from China, Tong Dynasty, China. These are the three Kongas that we know of all the decades of his teaching. And if on a scale of 10, Joju's Konga was 2 out of 10, this is about 5 out of 10. There are various difficulties, various ways to short circuit your own thinking or just point out your emotional habits. If you have a tendency to attach to your own karma, then kongas are very difficult. You can't solve them. They frustrate you. They ache. They produce unpleasant feelings, low self-esteem. And if you can let go of your karma, then your intuition kicks in. Suddenly, seemingly from nowhere, from the unknown, the answer comes. Get used to the function of this unknown. Get used to having this unknown on the top of your own personal pyramid, your own totem pole. And when you have that, then everything in you, your thinking, your feelings, your habits will serve that, will feed that. And that's when we can say we are on the Bodhisattva path. We are on the path to get enlightenment and we are on the path to help others get enlightenment. This experience of our common substance, our Buddha nature, this point is a very important motivator. Because it becomes clear that if we don't get enlightenment together, then no one will. No one, because our suffering will pull each other back. On this earth, in the last 2,500 years, we reproduce suffering way faster, in greater number, in larger mass, than we could produce enlightenment. That's the only problem. It is not that the teaching would not work. We've had great teachers. Jesus, Buddha, Lao Tzu, many others, Saint Francis, Bodhidharma. We know the homework as humanity, currently 7.8 billion and counting, just 20 million of that in Greater New York. We just haven't finished the lesson. Our tests have failed. We know the material. We know the books. We know what to do. We just don't do it. So many people are waiting for the next Buddha, Maitreya, the Buddha of love, or the second Messiah, again, to come and take away all our misery. Did they make it? Who made that? They did not make it, so they cannot take it away. Our suffering belongs to us. Our happiness also belongs to us. So fundamentally, we need to realize that if we want to truly understand the nature of this universe, then perceive it as created by mind alone. If that mind is clear, if our nature is clear, then this universe is also clear. If it's not, then we have ignorance, greed, and anger. And do not look for any other source than your own mind. Kongan practice helps us clear that mind. And next, we can use that to help all beings becoming free from suffering. So I think this is plenty for introductory. And now I would like to welcome your questions. Any kind of question is OK. You don't have to be educated in Buddhism. You don't have to be a long time practitioner. But questions are welcome. My question is, the way that you explain when we reach this status, is that the same when the people, they say they receive the Holy Spirit is inside of them? I don't know. I don't know what they attained before I have tea with them. <laughs> so we sit down, we have some tea, and we have a conversation. The conversation can include many things. It can include kongans too, but that's not the only measurement, okay? So without direct interaction, without understanding their mind, looking into their eyes, 
it's impossible to answer this question for me sincerely. So if there's anyone in that realm that you mentioned, they have received the spirit, it's wonderful. Invite them. Let's have some tea together. Thank you. Thank you. Could you please explain a little bit about Tonglen, how that works, and redemptive suffering? Tonglen belongs to Tibetan practice, which I am not proficient with or at. So Tonglen, to the best of my knowledge, is giving and taking. You see how you interact with the environment, with other people. What is it that you take from them? What is it that you give them in speech, action, thought, and emotions? These are the four major channels. Thus, you can perceive cause and effect. It's a very simple process. Just be aware what goes on on these four channels. And what is it that you identify with? What is it that you just let go? What is it that you polarize because you like it or dislike it? And what is it that you leave neutral? So giving and taking is actually like a cell in the body interacting with the rest of the body. What it gives and what it takes, what it binds and what it releases. Watch that. And if I am mistaken by the original definition of Tonglen practice, then I'm sorry. Is that what Jesus did? Is he considered to have? I don't know what he did. I just know that the loving kindness that he incorporated in his teaching is reaching us to the present day. What he taught, what words he spoke, there are so many versions of it. Who am I to know which words of his in the scripts were true or not? I do not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Can you actively pursue intuition? Yes, you can by not doing anything, by not pursuing anything, by consciously stopping the body, the energy, and the mind from moving. Not moving body, not moving energy, not moving speech, not moving mind. These are like the four locks on a safe. And when you have that, then the safe opens. I can tell you, this is not a spoiler, you won't find anything inside. But the walls of the safe disappear. Your fixed ego disappears. Your individual idea about yourself as an absolute characteristic disappears. That's when you're free. And the bonus is that your intuition appears out of this oneness. So you can actively do this. Just don't make anything. Don't move, don't want, don't attach. It's a huge energy, but it's static. It's in its potential. It's not moving, it's not acting, it's not speaking, it's not thinking. Read the Heart Sutra. No, 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 no. Neither, 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 nor, nor, nor. That's our user's manual, how not to go wrong. And if you don't go wrong, then you're clear. That's all. For the Hao Sutra, which English version do you prefer? See, I got used to a given Heart Sutra that was used by Zen Master Sung San students, both in America, Europe, and Asia. I use that. But honestly, I've seen so many translations that I already forgot how many versions I chanted so far. And it doesn't matter. Translations can differ, but the meaning is the same. Just chant the Heart Sutra, whichever that is. Doesn't matter which one. The most important part is the end. The gate, gate, paragate, parasam, gate, bodhisvaha. That's it. Before that, what kind of uh, grammar, syntax, morphology, not so important. More questions? From a practical viewpoint, what does practice look like day to day, moment to moment, week to week, year to year? When you sit, just sit. When you work, just work. When you speak, just speak. No echoes, no second guesses, no dualistic layers, no reactions. Just perceive cause and effect clearly. When you walk, where are you going? When you speak, what are you saying? When you work, what are you doing? So keeping this moment clear, keeping our direction clear, 
That's what we call practice without form. But in order to attain that and enter that, we must do some formal practice, okay? If you have any jobs that works with water, you can mix it in 10,000 ways, color it, spice it. You can do a million things with water. But if you don't attain pure H2O, then we don't know what water is. And first, we really attain ourselves, our true nature, and we can use it in 10,000 ways. A mature practitioner can do the formal practice and can do the practice without form as well, both. Some people say, I don't need meditation. I already understand. That's arrogance. Create suffering and mistakes down the line, next moment. The others, they love form to the last detail, very precise. And they are the Zen champions. You know, they, sit, they sit like this. Two hours, not moving. You say, knock, knock, can you help me chop some vegetables or clean the toilets? No, I'm meditating. That's preposterous, okay? If you cannot take your practice out of the Dharma room and help others with it, then what's the use, okay? So practice with form and practice without form. We have to be capable of both. Okay. More questions? It sounds like humility is a prerequisite for all this, for, and that the precepts, the prerequisite for is humility. But we never hear that word, well, I don't hear that word very often, especially in New York City. Could you talk a little bit about humility? Yeah, it's something that cannot come from the outside. There are many ways to induce humility, but your own experience of folly, arrogance, hypocrisy is the best teacher. No one is humble when they are 16, 17. We have our youth throbbing in our veins, shining in our eyes, and the next 10 years is about learning what we want to do on this earth in this life. You cannot just teach humility and expect people to follow it. And they see something's wrong, something's really wrong, then they can be taught because their ego is broken. Then true humility appears. Before that, it's manners. Maybe it's the correct attitude. But it's something you have learned, not really attained. So we talk about direction, perception, correct action, correct speech, etc. Because if you keep your awareness clear, then humility appears naturally. Try to tell someone, become Buddha. What is that? I don't understand. When you want to teach meaningful things to people, my limited experience shows that it's better they find it, not I give them. If they are interested in something and they find it out of their own effort, chances are they believe that way more than from anyone else. Your experience is the only thing that can truly teach you. Teachers can guide you to have that experience. Teachers can help you prevent some mistakes. But no one can give you the real experience that you are desiring or thirsty for. And that's why the most important qualities is something we can only realize, we can only attain, but we cannot just open it in a box and just buy one, get another free, or in six packs. It's not like that. That's why we don't teach that straight out of the box, but we answer questions about it. And humility is one of the most important attitudes towards life and another person. As strange as it may sound, it really starts with, you know, put your gun down. So I don't want to attack you. You don't want to attack me. This is the first. I don't want to be right over you. You don't want to be right over me. This is the first step. And it can go a very, very long way. Seeing how little we are, how huge the world is, and how much more important humanity is than just our individual self. But first things first. Experience can really teach us, and teaching can really guide us and it can lead to true humility. And it can translate into service, selfless help, and ultimately, with body and mind, helping all beings. Other questions? Thank you for being here. So when you talk about 
not seeing with a dualistic mind and not creating filters between you and reality, when you see that way or when you're sitting and you're not chasing your thoughts, what does that feel like inside of you? What color is this stick? It looks brown. That's what it feels like. It's a clear reflection. Non-dualistic mind is not special. See clearly, hear clearly, taste, smell, touch, very clearly. The physical senses are very easy, okay? But if you say the stick is bad, or it's good, then your dualistic mind crept in the way. It reared it, its ugly head, okay? And with thinking and feelings, it's very, very tricky because the soft signals of your intuition sometimes overshadowed or totally blotted out by your own mental habits. And that's why we need to practice and just completely wipe the mirror clean. We call that no mind, no thinking, no emotions, no movement. So that the subtle signals of intuition just could surface and you would actually perceive it instead of the super noise of your karma. And when there's only noise, that means there's only dualistic reaction, nothing else. You only make good and bad, right and wrong, me and other. All these dualistic things are like an engine in your mind. And sometimes it's very tiring, other times very dangerous, and after a while very boring. You just want this to stop. And that's when the mantra, the sitting, the bowing, the walking, the kongan practice can act actually help you get out of this suffering realm. So the dualistic mind is something we need. We need that. Otherwise, you cannot distinguish between clean and dirty, you and your environment, man and woman, earth and sky. So you need to distinguish. We need that. But we do not discriminate. We do not pass judgments. If we do that, we enter into suffering. But if you cannot distinguish, and you identify clean with dirty, wisdom with folly, healthy and poisonous, you also have a problem. So the distinguishing mind, the manas, if it underperforms, we have a problem. If it overperforms, we also have a problem. So see how the dualistic mind works, and let me give you just one piece of advice. Make that mind serve something higher, something other than itself. And during that service, it learns humility. It learns selflessness. In that seventh consciousness, the eighth is your memory, the sixth is your conceptual creative mind, and the first five are your physical senses. In that seventh consciousness, in the manas, your self-image is born. That's how we look at ourselves. And that self-image can be very radically different from our true nature, our true self, what we truly are not who we think we are. The greater the distance, the bigger the suffering. No distance, no suffering. That's how you can see how clearly your distinguishing mind works. Usually it's in an overdrive because we want to survive. We want to possess. We want to create or procreate. So instinctively we put ourselves above the rest of the world. We are more important than someone else putting ourselves first. Is this familiar? Big mistake. Because of that, human beings have huge problems here, elsewhere. It's not significant of a nation or a continent or a culture. It's just the way we are, built in. But when you totally go back to clarity and then your self-image stops being more important than the rest of the environment and we become one with the world, we attain our substance, then our self-image gets closer to our true nature. And eventually it can dissolve in it. It's a fundamental experience. It's like the water drop returns to the ocean and becomes the ocean. That's when your dualistic mind is very happy because it's gone. I guess I'm asking out of confusion. I heard you say earlier that something to the effect that you dared to use the word individual. And I've heard so much about no self. Mm -hmm. uh, but you said in the West, you said we have this idea too where we 
let go of a lot of, uh, I guess, false perceptions. But then uh, there's a, a resurrection experience. You say, you mentioned people even in the body, and then you said something to the effect that the, um, the truer self gets reconstituted. I'm asking out of confusion. I'd like you to elaborate on that. Your true self doesn't appear or disappear. That's why yeah. I prefer to refer to that as true nature. Okay. And your personality gets reconstructed. During practice, we literally die inside, and that's good. Your self-image disappears, but as you get out of this door, you have to appear as a United States citizen and dweller of the greater New York City area. You have to operate, you have to speak, but you don't speak in the same way as before practice. You have to act, but hopefully you act different from two years ago. So the self is reconstituted or reconstructed after practice, very spontaneously, and I should say very necessarily. When we talk about um, peeling away the layers towards your true self, I'm struggling with part of that involves like analyzation. No. Okay. Analysis actually solidifies the layers upon one another. Right. It's an explanation why they have to be there. Say that again? It's an explanation why the layers have to be on top of one another, how they belong together. Mm -hmm. What is it that makes me into what I am? Right. When the analysis stops, then the self-perpetuating movement of the intellect also stops. Okay. So when you stop thinking, then the layers actually peel off by themselves. Yeah. As long as you think, the layers are glued together. Right. Attachment to feelings and emotions, same. Mm -hmm. The moment you stop creating karma or being attached to karma, then the layers just naturally peel off. Why? All karma exists because you put energy and consciousness slash information into it. Mm -hmm. You deny that phenomenon from energy and information, it's gone. Same thing with anything inside or outside. Thank you. In addition, that's why analysis as self-help and self-healing has very limited effect. It is necessary to a certain extent to make the mind map clear, to wind up any confusion. Analysis can help in a way that the barrel helps the bullet. But the first foot and a half or two feet is a very, very, very small part of the actual trajectory of the bullet that can go a mile and a half. That's how analysis relates to actual practice. Thank you for your teaching. Concerning the koans, uh, you had mentioned that sometimes you get frustrated or people can get frustrated. Sometimes, very, I'm stressing sometimes, I'll be like, oh, I get it, or maybe Sensei Michael will read it and I'll get it, but honestly, most of the time I'm like, what the heck, you know? Keep that question. It's what the heck? Very important. Questions open the mind. Declarations, they kind of channel the mind. Definitions limit the mind, and dogmas imprison the mind. So keep the question. Keep this totally, absolutely, 360 degree open, what the heck, mind. It helps you a great deal. Then, because if you keep it like this, your mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. You attain the answer to the conga. Then, your mind kicks in, <gasps> I got that, wonderful! Yeah, where was that mind two minutes before? Where will that be two weeks after? when you are struggling with the next koan. It's a huge teaching. So keep the question, keep your direction. Wonderful. Thank you. Then your frustration teaches you. I've been studying the precepts. And the first precept, the translation is, do not kill. And I realize that I have killed significantly, not physically, but I have damaged and killed and the result was a great feeling of humility because I did such harm. 
but also a great feeling of sorrow. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, thinking, the sorrow is a little arrogant, which is, I'm supposed to be humble, but what right do I have to feel the sorrow? When you feel sorrow, just feel sorrow. And instead of reflecting on reflections, which is like multi-layer mental activity, it weakens the mind and perpetuates the self-image. Just perceive cause and effect. If you broke your precept, why did you do that? What was the result? And I do not correct you when I say you actually quoted a commandment, not a precept, because a precept begins with I vow not to take any life, not to take things not given, not to use intoxicants, not to tell lies, not to break relationships, etc. So then this I vow was broken. No one can command people to be humble, to save life, property, commitment, clarity, correctness. No one can really command us, just recommend us to do that. What was the motivation? What was the act? What was the result? The most painful thing is to perceive truth instead of reflecting on it. So when you feel sad, it's primary first reaction sadness. Feel that. Be with that. Do not react to your own sadness. Don't label the label. React to the reaction. Check your mind again, again, and again. Don't do that. Primary experience of the moment, inside and outside. And then you can be a wiser and more compassionate person. Okay. Last question. Before you began, you asked us to chant two syllables. They must have been significant to you. Do they have a meaning? Are they religious or are they universal? And is there a reason for seven times? Wow, this is not even one question. I know, it's like... It's like a centipede, which has go. so many I legs. I know, I like okay. that. So, I heard this mantra of the universe, Om, mm -hmm. purity, Nam, Sanskrit, first time in 1993. And we were having a whole world, a single flower conference in Korea. It was my last year as a layman. I didn't know that, but I was there and we put our hands in Hapchang, and my teacher asked about 2,000 people to chant Om Nam. And that was powerful. And uh, it created such a mindset that I like to recreate before Dharma speech because it wipes out your noise at least for 30 seconds. It really brings you back to the present. We really sync up mentally. And this oneness, this harmony, this clarity is achieved so simply with this chanting. And that's marvelous. That's why we use this mantra. Why seven times? I don't know. Not too short, not seven too long. Like really not too short, not too long. Me. There you go. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So I would like to thank Michael for his wonderful invitation. Everybody in this audience for your attention and wonderful questions. I sincerely hope that we continue our respective practices wherever we are, attain awakening, and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.